Hi everyone, my name is Beth Allen and I've been working at Perkins School for the Blind for 26 years. I began my career at Perkins working in the secondary program with the oldest kids who are about to graduate and for the past 16 years I've been working in the Early Learning Center program as a teacher and a TVI. I feel I have a, a bit of a unique perspective having worked at both ends of the educational spectrum. So for today, I'd like to talk about readiness skills for preschool, readiness skills for specifically for children who are visually impaired, and how to build a positive relationship with educational teens. Let's begin with readiness skills. Um, ready, school readiness skills are basically all the skills that um, kids need to be successful in school. These are attention, curiosity, information gathering, memory, persistence, and problem solving. So let's begin with attention. Attention is the ability to regulate actions and to focus on what the child needs to focus on. Specifically, kids need the ability to regulate their actions to focus on objects, activities, and people. In preschool, kids need to focus on um, their learning materials, their activities, the teacher, and their friends. For some students, this might look like sitting in a chair and turning towards the teacher who's speaking. To other students, it might mean you know, staying um, awake enough to be alert to participate in an activity. Attention begins to develop in um, young children when they attend to their parents' voices. And then they start to regulate their bodies and emotions during social interactions. If they're banging two blocks together because they like the noise, do the same thing. When they knock, you join in a knock and keep going with the activity as long as they're enjoying it. Then another time if they're playing this, see if you can, they will repeat the sound that you're making. So this time you knock and see if they'll follow up and do knocks. <laughs> Songs and finger play are um, another great way to get a child's attention and to extend it a little. Um, so for instance, if you're playing the itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. Now you play this again and again and the child learns this. So maybe one time you mix it up a little bit and say, the itsy bitsy spider went down the water spout. <laughs> and see if they react and pay attention to that because they can tell that it's different than usual. Next, we'll talk about curiosity. Curiosity is a desire to explore and learn. It's about the exploring and learning about objects and people. Children who are blind sometimes miss out on some of the cues sighted children have to inspire curiosity. So preschool kids um, learn by playing. A child who is blind might not see the shelf full of toys and all the options that are available to them. So they aren't driven by curiosity to explore these toys. And children with motor challenges have even less opportunities to be curious. So allow your kids time to explore. Um, sh share joy in what your kids like. Um, I had a student years ago who loved the sound of a dishwasher. So um, his mother just went with it. She let him push the button to start the dishwasher. She let him help load the dishwasher. <laughs> Um, she can help put the dishes in the dishwasher and she even made recordings of the sound so we could listen to it whenever he wanted to. So she was really sharing in his joy, even if it wasn't something typically um, you would think of as something enjoyable. Curiosity can be developed as simply as building secure attachments, which you're already doing, um, allowing your children time to explore and um, by sharing joy with your children. The next readiness skill I'll talk about is information gathering. 
So information gathering is gathering information from your senses. Um, at the earliest developmentals, children distinguish between words and just sounds. Then they begin to understand the words and their meanings. Kids gather um, tons of information through sight. So kids who are blind miss out a lot of, a, on a lot of incidental learning. One of the examples I like to use is a spoon. Um, sighted children see people using all kinds of spoons throughout the day. Mom stirring a pot on the stove, dad's um, using a spoon to serve salad. A child who's blind, however, might only know the spoon that they use. And a child with physical impairments might only know the part of the spoon that touches their lip when they're being fed. So to make up for this lack of incidental learning, kids need to touch, taste, hear, and smell all sorts of spoons to learn the spoonness of, spoonness of spoons. I like to give um, my kids um, a big bin full of spoons. Um, and they, I just let them explore it on their own. So they're touching metal spoons, wooden spoons, plastic spoons. Some are big, some are small. They make different sounds when they clang together. Um, the kids throw them on the floor. Um, they put them in their mouths, which is the benefit to me of spoons because they're easy to clean and um, I know they're safe for kids to put in their mouth. Um, kids need to initiate movement to learn if I just handed a child a spoon one by one and said, spoon, um, they wouldn't learn to gather information. Um, kids with motor difficulties could just take this tray and wiggle their fingers around. They'd hear the way the different sounds the spoons make. Um, they might be able to get it into their mouth. They push it off their tray. They hear the different sounds when they push it off their wheelchair tray. And you can do this sort of activity with anything. Um, you know, just give them a whole bunch of different objects, a big bin full of balls they can play with. Um, you can do it with clothes. Uh, let them ex explore the pots and pans. Any of these are great activities for um, encouraging information gathering. Um, young kids gather information through social interactions. Very young kids with um, visual impairments, their social interactions will differ, might differ from that of sighted kids. So a baby who sees his mother coming may get excited and make cooing noises and um, lots of movement because they're excited to see their mom. Whereas a um, visually impaired child may get very quiet because they're listening very carefully and paying attention to the sounds that they hear in anticipation of their mother coming over. Another way to help your kids learn to gather information is to use meaningful language to describe um, repeated routines and activities that you, all the different things you do throughout the day. So for example, in the case of a um, getting ready for bed, you might start with, all right, we're gonna wash your face. Oh, look, I have this blue washcloth. The water feels so nice and warm. Can you feel how nice and warm it is? Um, Next, we're going to dry off your face with a towel. Um, you can talk about how the towel is soft and it's dry. Uh, maybe it's fuzzy. Um, you can describe like, oh, first I'm going to dry your cheek. Now I'm going to dry your nose. Now I'm going to dry your chin. And they're getting all sorts of like really good language in there. Then you talk about their toothbrush and the toothpaste. The toothpaste smells minty. The toothbrush is wet. The handle it has a long handle and then finally when they're hopping into bed here's your nice soft bunny i like his long ears that feel silky on the inside and here's your nice um, warm snuggly blanket and all this meaningful language helps prevent kids who are blind from becoming passive information gatherers so to encourage information gathering in your kid just let them use all their senses to gather information um, encourage lots of social interactions, have lots of social interactions with your kids, and use meaningful language throughout the day. The next readiness skill I'd like to talk about is memory. Memory is retrieving stored information and repeating practice actions. Preschool kids memorize 
um, songs and games. They start learning shapes and the alphabet. And eventually they go on to learn to read and to write and all sorts of different activities. But at the earliest developmental levels, children learn that the world is predictable. They start to remember that this thing in my mouth is my pacifier. Or when I hear th that and I smell that, that means my bottle's coming. I remember that. That voice is my brother's. I remember that. Um, they learn to store information to build a more complex understanding. You can help your kids learn to store information and build their memory by repeating routines and songs and activities and pairing this with meaningful language. I talked a little bit before about a bedtime routine. So if you try and do the routine the same way every day, first wash your face, face then dry your face, then you brush your teeth, then you lay down in bed with your bunny, the kids will start to remember that and they'll be able to predict what's next. So for example, some days you might say, all right, we just washed your face. Now what do we do next? Right, we, you, you know, you dry your face. Um, or you can say, I gave you your bunny. What else do you need? And they can say, my blanket. Kids develop their memory through um, repeated songs and um, favorite games. There's a parachute game that every kid loves um, that we play at school and it goes, the wind blows north and the wind blows south. The wind blows east and west. The wind blows all around the town, but the one it likes the best is, and then we choose a different child each time we sing it. So you can tell when the kids start to learn the activity, they anticipate that their turn is coming up. So they'll get real quiet and still when it comes to the part where the one it likes the best is. And so that's how you can show that they're using their memory of the game by anticipating what's happening next. The next readiness skill I'd like to talk about is persistence. Persistence is um, regulating frustration to work on challenging tasks. You can help kids learn how to be persistent by teaching them how to self-regulate. For example, if your child needs a pacifier, or as I call it, a binky to stay awake, put the binky on a clip on their shirt so they can find it on their own and then they can calm themselves down. They don't have to rely on anyone else for that. That also teaches object permanence because they remember, oh, my binky's always there. For a lot of my students, starting in preschool means tolerating sitting in a chair instead of running around the classroom and playing with toys um, like they do at home. They'd just be able to play whatever way they want to do it. Um, but I'm making them sit in a chair and check out the days of the week. <laughs> and that can be really hard for kids to tolerate. Um, other kids are just struggling to stay alert enough to be awake for the activity. You know, they might be on seizure meds or they might just be a sleepy kid or they didn't sleep good the night before. And now I'm asking them to look at this bouncing yellow slinky. And, <laughs> you know, if it's too much, they're just going to cry or fall asleep and tune me out. Either way, they aren't ready to learn. So you can help build persistence um, in your kids by helping them learn how to self-regulate. Um, make sure to practice this when they're, you know, building persistence when they're rested, they're happy, they're comfortable. If a child's overtired, if you're overtired, um, neither one of you is going to be able to have the persistence to push through. And then when it is going well, make sure to stop before they become completely frustrated and catch it. <laughs> like I said, not easy, but if you can catch it just before, you'll be able to push them as, as far as they can and they can learn. The final readiness skill I'm going to talk about is problem solving. Problem solving is encountering a problem and then solving the problem through trial and error. Young kids need to solve problems like they're hungry or they want a toy that they can't reach or they need to go to the bathroom. And they start by using language. They say, mom, I'm hungry. Dad, can you get me that? Um, or I need to go use the potty. Um, but pretty soon 
they start to be able to go get the snack on their own. And maybe they climb on a chair to reach that toy they can't reach. Maybe they just go to the potty on their own. Kids who are blind can develop learned helplessness. Allow your kids time to find solutions through trial and error. This can be really hard. It's also not something you want to work on, say, if you need to get out of the house and get the kid to daycare. It's not a good time to work on putting their shoes on independently. But if it's a weekend and you're not a Russian um, to go anywhere, just let your try, child try and figure it out on their own. At Perkins, we tell people to figuratively and sometimes literally sit on their hands so that to hold them back from jumping in and helping because it can take all your will not to be like, I'm just going to go help them hang up their coat or I'm going to help them find that toy that's right there, but they just haven't found it yet. But you really, it's important to let the kids learn how to solve their own problems. Another thing that helps sometimes is if a child is working on a task and it feels like it's taking forever, if you take out your phone and just time it, it might feel like you've waited, you know, five minutes, but it may have only been 30 seconds. Um, so once you kind of know, all right, I can tolerate 30 seconds. That's all it takes and I can sit through it. So to encourage problem solving in your kids, um, allow your child time to solve problems through trial and error. If you need to, um, use a timer to help you be able to be patient long enough. And then um, allow plenty of opportunities for your child to ask for more or to ask for continuation of an activity that they really prefer. So these are some ways you can help your kids work on readiness for preschool or not because <laughs> you don't have to do any of this. Um, we're all, we have busy lives. Um, we're all running a little low on bandwidth these days. So if you don't have time to, you know, wait for your kid to put their shoes on or do any of these things, don't feel guilty. You, you're taking your time on a Saturday to come here to learn to help your child learn better. If you're doing that, I guarantee you're doing a good job as a parent. So if you, if there are some things you can't do, you're doing the best you can and don't worry about it. And that is the beauty of special ed because we meet the child wherever they are. So if they're still working on persistence, they haven't learned to push through things, that's our job. We'll get working on that. Um, it's always good to work on these things at home too, but it's it's hotter. You know, I go home at the end of the day. Um, parents have their kid 24-7. If they're not with them while they're at school, you guys are worry about, about them, so you still have them. It takes a lot, and you need to take, you know, do the best you can and don't sweat it. Next, I'm going to talk about some readiness skills that are specific for kids with visual impairments. Visual impairments affect how kids gather information. Verbal descriptions and limited hands-on experiences just don't equal the constant incidental learning that um, visual learners experience. I gave an example earlier of spoons. If a child's information of spoons was only based on the tray of spoons that I showed them and maybe a verbal description, they might understand um, the spoonness of spoons. You know, they have a scoop and a long handle. Um, but they wouldn't fully understand the concept of spoons. A concept is a mental representation of objects or ideas. These can be um, tangible like a spoon or an apple, or they can be intangible like emotions or colors. To build these concepts, children need stimulation, motivation, and movement through the meaningful activities. So what are meaningful activities? These are just purposeful activities that your child enjoys. They don't have to be elaborate or fancy. Um, getting dressed is a really meaningful activity. Um, while you're getting dressed, let the child explore their clothes. Um, figure out which one is the shirt, which one is the pants. Um, oh, I can feel the tag in the back of the pants. That's how I know that part goes in the back. Um, I have two socks here because I have two feet. Um, use lots of meaningful language. Um, the, these pants have two long legs. Um, the shirt is very soft. 
even better let your child explore their bureau and find here are all the different pants I have. Here's a shirt. I keep my shoes over here. Um, those are real meaningful ex experiences. When you're making breakfast for your little one, um, let them be in the kitchen with you. If you're giving him an apple for breakfast, let them take the apple out of the fridge, feel it, how cold it is, how it's smooth on the outside, and then show them the difference when you cut it up. Let them help pour the cereal out of the cereal box. So for stimulation, kids get stimulation from a wide variety of sensory experiences. I'm sure you all have firsthand experience of kids that are visually impaired having a strong reaction to some sensory experiences. And this is where the meaningful part of their experiences um, helps them tolerate it and provide some motivation. So for example, some kids hate the feeling of walking barefoot on grass, um, but if they're walking towards their favorite toy or say they're walking over to the swing, which is their favorite activity, they might be able to tolerate it. Or even if they're just sitting on their parent's lap and um, while well, their parent's reading them a story or they're playing a game, then they can tolerate it that much more. The sound of a blender can be really awful for a lot of kids, especially kids with visual impairments. But if say you're making them a milkshake and that's their favorite thing in the world, that's a lot of motivation. Um, you can have them help turn on the blender. Um, so like I'll usually go one, two, three, turn it on. And then you can let them press the button. And that way they, they have control. And if it's too much, they can take their finger off. Next is motivation. Motivation, like we talked about the milkshake or the really fun toy being the motivation to get a child to engage in a sensory activity they don't like. Um, motivation is crucial to get kids act, to actively engage in uh, what you'd like them to do and to have really meaningful experiences. So motivation is also crucial. I talked a little bit ago about the milkshake maybe being uh, the motivation to use a blender. Um, kids need, you know, like all of us, the right motivation to push through things. Um, so for the little kids in the preschool, there's a classic um, skill we measure on assessments. That's how long you can hold your hands up above your head, you know, 10 seconds, five seconds. I'm not sure what the actual measurement is. Um, but if you said to a kid, all right, we're going to do exercises. Everyone lift your hands up and down, you know. Why do they want to get involved with that? I can give them cues. I can do hand on their hand. They're not interested. However, you put it part of a song. Now they're in. So say, you know, the grand old Duke of York, <laughs> he had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill and he marched them down again. You keep doing that and then they're building up their endurance and they have the motivation to do it because it's the fun part of a game. Movement is important to um, keep these act uh, meaningful activities um, active. Um, kids who are visually impaired are at risk for becoming passive learners. So, you know, let's get those kids moving. Um, let them explore rooms of the house, explore the backyard. Um, some of your kids have limited motor skills, but they can still be very active. Um, they can use a switch to play music or to activate a toy. Um, little rooms and active learning activities are amazing for this. Um, you know, by putting uh, exciting, uh, motivating things within a child's reach where they can easily reach them will really get them to get moving and to get exploring things actively. There's tons of information online um, and on the Perkins website too about different tips for different active learning activities um, to get kids with motor ability and motor limitations moving and active. Kids who are visually impaired need lots of concrete and meaningful varied experiences to develop concepts and lots of repetition. As we've already discussed, tactual learning is not the same as visual learning. It takes longer 
because um, they experience objects one part at a time. A child with sight experiences a whole object before touching it. But for a child with visual impairments, they start with the parts and then they can understand the whole object. A child with sight experiences a baby carriage as a whole before playing with it. A child with visual impairments may start with the handle, then notice the wheels. A baby carriage feels quite different depending on which part of it you're touching. Finally, after repeatedly experiencing the parts, they develop the concept of the whole baby carriage. Meaningful experiences can help prevent empty language. Some children who are visually impaired use words that they don't really understand. Um, I had a student years ago who loved to talk about um, colors. She really liked to talk about the color of people's shirts. And so she would say, oh, daddy has a red shirt on or I'm wearing a blue shirt. But then sometimes she would label different things as uh, navy red or lime black. <laughs> So that's a classic example of empty language. She heard those words and she kind of knew the context of you know, how to use them, but she didn't really understand what they meant. Finally, I'm gonna talk about um, transitioning to preschool and developing a positive relationship with your educational teens. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the transition to preschool in developing a positive relationship with the educational team. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of my job and one of the jobs I take most seriously. Um, when I was new at Perkins and I worked in the residential program, I remember a dad dropping his son off and he hugged his son and as he walked about away, he was crying. Now this is a student who's high school age and he's gonna be living with us residentially. And it really struck me in that moment how much parents have to trust the people who work with their kids and how much of an honor it is to me that people do trust me with their kids. So I take it very seriously and um, all teachers do. We get it, you're scared. You know, we, most of us have kids of our own <laughs> that we've had to put in the trust of someone else. But with kids with disabilities who might not be um, able to tell you what happened at school, um, they might need to have, um, you know, help uh, people change their diaper. They might have medical conditions that you have to rely on someone else to take care of. That takes more trust than um, sending, you know, a typical child off to preschool. So, um, and it also brings up a lot of feelings. So you're changing from the IFSP, the family plan, to an IEP, the individual plan. And that's not just a name only. You know, now it's more about your child. What are their strengths, their weaknesses? Um, and it's a little bit more removed from the family. This goes on through school where, you know, as kids get older, now the kids are making some of their own decisions. They're attending the meetings. By the time they're grown ups, it's their vision statement, what they want to do. All these things are big transitions for parents and they're, they're hard to handle. But in many ways, you know, parents can build their preschool readiness skills and try and prepare themselves for the transition to make it easier um, for you and your child and everyone involved. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is trust and communication. So when a child goes to preschool, you're switching from maybe um, getting their services at home or in a daycare now to getting services in a school you won't be able to see exactly what the therapists are doing each day. You might get reports, but that's not the same as watching them do, say, the exercises or the activities. Um, the teacher's in charge of feeding them. You know, do they get enough to eat? Uh, being aware of um, if they start to not feel good or if they're sad, how will you, you know, how will you know they're being taken care of? This, this can be daunting, you know, if you think of it beforehand, um, but if you, with the right amount of communication between the educational team and the family, it makes it easier to build that trust so you can send your child off without worry. In the Early Learning Center, we send a communication book home uh, back and forth each day with the students. And we write, has the child's name on the top, we write what classes they had that day, what they ate for their lunch and for snack, um, if they had a bowel movement, because that's important, 
and um, you know how their day went. So we write a little blurb and it might be just, oh, oh my goodness, Jimmy had a great time in circle time today. He clapped his hands as part of, if you're happy and you know it, we're so proud of him. It might be, you know, oh my goodness, Imani seems so sleepy today. You know, did she have a good sleep last night? Has there been a med change or anything like that? Um, it could be, you know, uh, Sally fell down at the playground and she skinned her knee. Um, I, if something's an emergency, say she fell down and she really cut her knee, I call you up on the phone. <laughs> you know, for serious things, it's phone calls first. But for something little like they just bumped their knee, you might see it. Um, I also would write, like a lot of times kids come in and I would write, oh, I noticed they had a little bruise on her wrist. And the reason why I write that, it might seem like, you know, what's that all about? But maybe you didn't see the bruise there this morning. Um, maybe it happened on the bus and neither one of us saw it. You, you know, you just might want to be aware of things like that. Then the parents write on the page um, a report from home. Just some of the basics, how they slept. Um, were they able to have breakfast in the morning? Did they have a BM? Always important. And um, maybe a little blurb from the day, like, um, you know, Jimmy had a great time playing with his Nana last night. Or um, we did have a med change, so Amani is really sleepy, might be sleepy today. Keep an eye on that. Um, uh, different things like that. You might say, Sally came home with a bruise. Do you remember seeing that? Um, once again, if there's ever anything you're worried about, go for the phone call first if it's something you're really worried about. But if it's something that you, you know, you're just like, eh, maybe I better check on it. That's the kind of thing you write in the book. And that's a good way to build, you know, trust with the educational team because you're getting that back and forth information. The next thing I'd like to talk about is trusting your instincts. You as parents know your child best. I spend, you know, a lot of time with students. I might have them for three years, but no one knows them better than their parents. So I always say, trust your instincts. And I've learned this uh, over the years in many different ways. Recently, I had a student who was starting, you know, is he um, in preschool and her mother said, you know, I don't think she can spend the whole, you know, six hour day at school. And I said, you know, that's fine. A lot of kids at young only do a half day at school. And she said, no, I think she needs to start an hour at a time and we'll build up each week and add another hour. Now in my mind, I thought, ah, you know, of course she can spend, you know what I mean? She doesn't need that much time at home, but I've learned over the years to trust parents. And luckily um, at Perkins, we have a lot of leeway <laughs> and we're able to work around the schedules like that. It might not be as easy in public school, but we did it and after getting to know the student and once we finally worked her up full, full days, I was like, you know what? Her mom was absolutely right. That was what was best for this child and for her mother. Now for other people, they might not have the luxury of dropping off, you know, being able to wait in the car for an hour on the first day and then build up to two days and take that time at home. Not everyone has that. So if this had been the exact same situation with someone who needed to get to work, that would have been fine too. We could get through that, that, you know, she might've struggled a little bit more, had some behaviors, but we would have got her through it. But so it's what, you know, trust what's right for your family and what's best for you. And it's not gonna be the same as anyone else. Another way to have a positive relationship with um, your educational team is to have good boundaries. Um, boundaries vary a little bit from person to person. But the ultimate thing is, you know, I'm a teacher and I'm not a friend. I'm not friends with um, my student, you know, I'm their teacher. And um, unfortunately, I'm not friends with their parents. We can have a good working relationship. We can, you know, enjoy laughing at some jokes, um, share joy in watching their children grow up. But um, at the end of the day, you know, I go home and in a year, maybe the kids will have a new teacher. So if, if the parents only trust me with their child, then I haven't done my job. And in the same way, a lot of times with a kid, you know, a, a kid say has difficult behaviors and he might only behave for me. 
Well, if that's the case, then I haven't done my job because what if I got sick? What if I got a new job? Then that kid is stuck without the supports that they need. But if I teach a child how to, you know, take care of themselves, how to manage their own behavior and how to work with any number of people, then they have the skills they need to go on to the next grade. There's a lot of information to take in as a parent of, um, you know, a student with disability or visual impairments. You know, the reports, uh, you know, an average CVI report at Perkins might be 15 pages long. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of information and that's just their vision. Um, and it can be really dense, dense information. So never be afraid to reach out to the team for clarification. Um, sometimes we forget, like even um, if, if my husband goes to a party with me where we're all teachers, he'll go, I didn't understand 90% of what you were talking about. You know, it's like all initials, alphabet soup, OT, TVI, SMI, you know, CPPI, <laughs> it, it's like a code. And so and we can very easily forget that not everyone knows that code, you know, so reach out to, you, to you, the educational team if you don't get it. Never feel bad about asking a question. Thank you for joining my presentation. Um, I really appreciate you coming and bearing with me. Scan the QR code if you want any of my references or resources. Thank you.